Luke, Luke chapter 10, hyperspeed, seatbelts. Luke 10, verse 25. Last week, I preached out of one single verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, not just America, but the world, not just Israel, but the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We broke that down. I actually had one of my associates say to me, I've never heard a sermon preached on that one verse. And uh, it was uh, a joy to do it. But I'm going to tell you this. The answer is so simple. It's in front of our face. One of the uh, leaders of Hamas was converted and made the statement. And Tommy, I listened to the testimony and it moved me on my way to New Caney from here to there that he shared that it was the love of Jesus that changed his life and uh, he understood he was raised to hate and when you're raised to hate and that's all you know is hate then you're going to hate whoever you're to be hating uh, one of my and I don't care if you like him or not he uh, he affected me when I was a young believer his name's Bob Dylan Bob Dylan was singing in a concert, traveling with a tremendous amount of orchestra and musicians, and uh, burnt out from drugs and alcohol and uh, promiscuous living. He's on stage, and right before he left stage, somebody threw a cross up on the stage, and he picked up the cross and he put it in his pocket. And Dylan, I believe Dylan's a Jew too. Uh, he looks a little bit similar. Uh, I'm just, I know I'm stereotyping, but anyway, uh, so do you. Um, so he gets to a hotel, and he pulls out the cross, and Jesus appeared in the hotel room. And he said, I know that's crazy sounding, but he touched me, and I felt it. And everything evil in me left me. And I wrote a song, Slow Train Coming. And again, you got to be old to know any of these songs. And the album was called Slow Train Coming. Then he wrote us another album called Saved. And you've heard Third Day cover a lot of his songs. And then he wrote another song, album called Shot of Love. And uh, these three albums changed me. They affected me. Amen. And, uh, and so much so that because he recorded in Muscle Shows, Alabama, where I'm from, and, and I listened to him, and I, it's funny. The band and I got together. Johnny, this is another one you're going to have to check out. Uh, but the, he, the, the music so moved me because it had compassion in it. It had uh, passion, and I love passion in music. That's why when I hear the band sing, there's certain songs they do, and it's just passion that affects me. And so I'm telling you that ideology has to change. The... Israel can destroy Hamas, but it will not destroy the ideology of hatred. The only thing that changes that is love. The only thing that takes racism out of your life is love. The only thing that removes hatred from your life, of course, is love. What dispels darkness is light. So it's important to understand that uh, in, in our lives, we, we might have attacked uh, people in Afghanistan and sent soldiers there, but it doesn't change them. What changes them is the love of God. And until we figure this out and get this out, and it's going to take generations for this thing to shift, but I would believe in the love of God. It changed me. Can I get an amen? Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Speaking of the love of God, we moved from last week. Jesus said, for God so loved, he talked to Nicodemus, Nick at night. Amen. And after that, in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, I'm glad some of y'all got that. Uh, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up, a lawyer. If there's anybody, any group of people that I struggle with, on one occasion, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, what's written in the law? He replied, how, how do you read it? Verse 27. You know, that's a good point. How do you, how do you read this? How do, you, do you just read it page by page? You just read the red and pray for the power. How, how do you read this? Uh, how do, you know, when you read, I watch starting Genesis and work through it, and I, I bog down in Leviticus. <laughs> I, I get in Revelation, and I ain't got no Revelation at all. I mean, how do you read this? 
That's what he's saying to the man. So he gets there and he says, how do you read it? And he said, well, I, this is what I read. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. Oh, yeah, and, and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly. Jesus replied, do this and you'll live. But he, that but starts it all. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Which is another way of saying, I'm pretty good at loving the Lord, get my God with all my heart, soul, and strength, but I ain't real good with my neighbor. Isn't that us? Amen. We're real good at saying we love Jesus at church and, and all our hearts on the street. But my, my, my neighbor, who's my neighbor? Amen. And it ain't just the one that lives next door. So when Jesus said to the man, a man was going from Jerusalem to Jericho, and when he fell into the hands of robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Wow. A priest came. Happened. I love the word happened. In other words, it was not a divine appointment. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, who is also a religious worshiper, when he came to the place, he just passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, oh, how dare you, Jesus? A Samaritan, a dog, that's who y'all call them, a Gentile, as he traveled, he came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. The word pity there is translated compassion. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he put the man on his own donkey. He took him to an inn, a hotel, a hospital, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. He said, look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of the three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, well, the one who had mercy, compassion, the one who had pity on him. Jesus said, go and do likewise. Wow, what a word. Father, I love you. Thank you for your word. Let it change my life first, and if hopefully maybe somebody else's in Jesus' name. And everyone said, I, I want to focus on something here, the term leaving him half dead, half dead. How many times? And somebody been left half dead. Life is drained out of you. Your emotion is shattered. <sighs> Exhausted. Don't know what else to do. Beat him, left him half dead. And there is where the compassion was. And we, we don't know why he went down. The Bible says he went down. It's 18 miles from Jerusalem to Jericho. It's a winding road. It's a, it's a, it's a Harley rider's dream, I'm telling you. It's just curve after curve after curve. It's the dragon's tail on steroids. Amen. It's just coming straight down. And again, only a few of us would know what I just said. But the fact his back was turned to one place and his heart was toward another. Jerusalem, the word actually means the center of worship. Amen. Jericho actually means a curse. It, it means lured by fragrance. It's the road there. It was a decline. And it led down to the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea was something that took in but never gave back. A lot of people are Dead Seas. They take in, never give back. They're takers, so they're not givers. They don't reciprocate. They are attachments. Don't even give me an amen. I know who you are. Amen. So we are at a moment when our nation is deeply divided. I mean, we are divided. It's not just Republican. It's not just uh, Democrat. It's not just believers and, and heathens. Amen. We're just divided. We're divided in our families. Amen. The, the pandemic divided us. So many things have divided us. And I think people are beginning to see that it's going to take more than money to rebuild our cities, our homes. I, I remember JJ just asked me, she said, Pastor, you have been to San Francisco? She saw a card. I said, absolutely. 20 years ago, I said, San Francisco was a wonderful place. Only met a couple of panhandlers there. Now, I wouldn't even fly there. In 20 years, the whole city has gone downhill. We have so divided. Things have been, people have been stealing. Robbers have been breaking in. Uh, things you never dreamed would happen in this nation is beginning to ha happen. And, and again, take note of the Middle East. And again, it's, it's a war of theology. It's a war of ideology. It's how you see God. And unless thinking changes, it won't change. I've said this for years. Unless you're, unless you're stinking thinking, changes you don't change what we need is a birth of compassion amen what he said here that he met a man half dead he's half dead i mean his, his life is drained out and the compassion defined 
Compassion, we talked about love last week. Now let's define it a little better. Compassion means to suffer with another person. The word has a strong personal element. Webster said is suffering with another person or painful sympathy. I mean, it's to hurt for them. It's to feel their pain. When you, If you've ever gone through cancer or been with a cancer patient and you meet somebody else, you, you, it, your heart goes out for them. When I see somebody that, who walks the way that I walk and struggles with their legs, I, I have this passion, this compassion comes over me. Amen. There's certain things you've gone through in life that, that because of maybe a loved one who passed, you hurt for somebody else. Tears begin to fill your eyes. It's a painful, but it's sympathy. Amen. You feel for them. And that's what Jesus is talking about. This man was left half dead, and there was a sympathy to reach out to the Samaritan, to pick him up, to, to uh, take care of his wounds, to pour in oil, to pour in wine, to put him in his own electric vehicle. <laughs> Amen. Take him to the Holiday Inn and, and tell the innkeeper, you take care of him. I'm going to take care of a couple of weeks for you. Amen. When I come back, if, he, if I owe more, I'll take care of that. Listen, it's when our hearts are broke. My, heart's, my heart broke years ago when I realized I couldn't even get into a room to pray over people who were put inside there because the government said, I may catch what they got. Amen. And I'm yelling through a window, I love you. And the last thing I saw was them looking back at me, I love you too. And then I did their funeral. But I couldn't touch them. I couldn't go in and connect with them. It bothered me. It affected me. That's that painful sympathy. Amen. We find it in the prodigal son. Luke chapter 15, verse 17. When he came to his senses, who? The prodigal. He left. He took his dad's inheritance and he left. Amen. The brother, one brother at home, one brother's gone. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. Starving to death. What is he? Half dead. Amen. He's half dead. He's with, I promise you, when the father saw him at a distance, he saw a shell of a son who had left. Amen. His body had withered up. He had lived, he'd been involved in riotous living. That, that's, a, that's a bourbon street. Amen. Not leaving. Going there and staying there. Amen. He said, I'm going to set out and I'm going to go back to my father and say to him, Daddy, I sinned against heaven. I sinned against you. Listen, this is when you hit bottom. Many of us parents, grandparents, guardians, we have family. We got friends. We got kids that haven't hit bottom yet. Eventually, they're going to hit bottom. And what you want to hear is them say, Hey, Daddy, I'm sorry. Mama, I, forgive me. Amen. God in heaven, I messed up. When you hear that, things begin to shift and change. Amen. That's when they've hit bottom. And, and he said, I'm no longer worthy. Listen to his heart. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. As a matter of fact, make me one of your hired servants. At least then I get to eat. At least then I get to be taken care of. At least then I got to shack out back. Amen. And the daddy wouldn't do it. The scripture says, so he got up and he went and his father saw him and felt compassion. And what did the dad do? He ran and embraced him. He got hold of that boy and he hugged that boy. See, that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about compassion. Sympathy, even painful. See, I feel for you. See, there's no way you're going to take that love out of my heart for my kids. I love my five kids, and as a matter of fact, I love a lot of your kids, and sometimes I wonder. <laughs> your heart breaks for them. Amen. You hold them, you embrace them, you, you reach and you, you, you squeeze the skeletal, amen, bones that they've got because now they've shrunk up, and all they were asking for is just make me a servant. No, 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 you're never going to be a servant. I'm going to put a ring on your finger, I'm going to put shoes on your feet. I'm going to put a robe on your back, and anybody that threw stuff at you, they got to know that I'm still your daddy. I still love you. And that's what our father did for us when we came to him. When we ran back to him, we said, forgive us, because we messed up. We, we left. We left Jerusalem. We went to Jericho. We got beat up by robbers. We got passed by by religion. And you hugged us. You, you loved us. God, you had a love for us. I, I didn't understand your love till I saw Jesus on the cross. Yeah. When I saw him on the cross, then I understood at that moment how much that you cared for us. So it's more than just feeling sorry for people. Amen. Uh, they in trouble. I feel sorry. No, 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 no. Biblical compassion means what? And when you see the problem, you're moved by the need. You've got to be where the problem is, and you get your hands dirty trying to help one person after another. Amen. You're trying to help them solve a problem, but you can't do it until they hit bottom. 
You can't do it till they get the robbers and beat them up and stripped them and left them half dead. Amen. That's what we're looking for. And I read it over and over in Scripture, Matthew 14, 14, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. You know, Matthew 14, now we're moving to Jesus, getting in a boat, and Peter walk, walking on the water with Jesus. At that moment, there were 5,000. Then we move, and we find it happened again. It didn't just happen once. Jesus fed two groups of people with fish and bread. In Matthew 15, Jesus left there, went along the Sea of Galilee. Then he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame. They brought the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet, and he healed them. And people were amazed when they saw the, the mute speaking, the crippled made well. I wonder, those who couldn't speak, what were their first words? I can tell you what I believe it was. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Je uh, Amen. Thank you. And, and they praised the God of Israel. Verse 32. And Jesus called his disciples to him, to, the, to him and said, I have compassion for these people. Amen. He had compassion after he healed them. Amen. After he blessed them. They've already been with me three days. They've nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry or they may collapse on the way. Collapse. Half dead. Left half dead. They're going to be half dead if we don't do something for them. They've gone three days without eating. Can I encourage you to do something fast? I know January is coming. Quit waiting on January and have anxiety about it. January is coming. I know pastor's going to do it January. We're all going to be fasting in January. I got to get fast now. Take a day. Shoot. Some of you just take a meal. Just do without a water burger milkshake. Cut yourself back somewhere to the point where you start feeling emotion. My youngest son, he'll start fasting. He did it again uh, two weeks ago. As soon as he starts fasting, he, he's, it was fun. He comes straight to me after about two weeks. Emotion hits him. Sympathy hits him. Amen. Uh, love for his daddy hits him. Amen. He starts reading his Bible again. Katie, it blows my mind. But, it's, but fasting does something for you. Three days. They went three days without food. Jesus said, they're going to collapse. I got uh, the half dead. Amen. They've been traveling. His disciples answered, where are we going to get enough bread in a remote place like this? It's not a McDonald's for 40 miles. How many loaves do you have, Jesus? Eh? We got seven, they replied, and a few small fish. He told the crowd to sit down. What did he do? Just like he did before. He multiplied the loaves and the fish. Gave it to the people. They all ate, verse 37, satisfied. And afterward, the disciples picked up, watch, this time seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was 4,000 men. 4,000 men besides women and children. After Jesus had sent the crowd away, he got into the boat and he went to the vicinity of Magadan. Amen. So he felt the same compassion to this crowd. There were, two, there were blind men in Matthew chapter 20, verse 29. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. So where's he at now? He's in Jericho. In other words, he went to the place of cursing, of hatred, of meanness, where people didn't understand him the most, he's in Jericho. And there are two blind men who are sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have compassion, have mercy on us. And the crowd rebuked them. Amen. They said, Shh, hush up. But they shouted all the louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus stopped and called, what do you want me to do for you? Listen, if two blind men are telling you to have mercy on them and they ask you to, and you ask them, what do you want? You know what he knows? He knows what you want. He know, You say, well, he ought to know that my leg hurts. Well, of course he does. But he wants to know, do you know what you want? So you go ahead and tell me, my leg hurts. Amen. I want to pray for my leg. I want to pray for my head. I want to pray for this. Amen. And the Bible says, the Lord, they answered, we want our sight. And Jesus had compassion. Had compassion. And touched their eyes immediately. They received their sight and followed him. Before my sister Sandy passed away, I was called to Alabama because she fell and broke her femur. Many of you know that my sister was, uh, had special needs. And she went through a blindness that I can't explain. I've, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with this. But after she broke her leg, the pain was so intense that she lost her eyesight. 
and I, I can't remember ever talking about this. This was back uh, uh, seven, eight years ago. It was right when I got that red SRT Dodge. And uh, I went to the hospital there, and I sat with her, and she couldn't see. She'd look up at the light, and she couldn't see the light. I could turn the light off, and there would be no difference in, in when the light was dim or the light was on. She couldn't see. And she, she would cry out to me, Brother! And it was, you know, my sister had a way of moving me and affecting me. I, in high school, well, most of the fights I got in high school was defending my sister. And she would move me, and she's, Brother, I can't see. And her eyes would be wide open, and she's not able to see anything. And I'd have to put things in front of her face and, and say, here's a, here's a drink, and here's something to eat. And, and I stayed in the hospital with her for three nights. And, and, uh, and then all of a sudden, her eyes opened. But that, but. During that time, I, I was moved with sympathy for her because she could not see no more. She couldn't see my face. She, could, she would touch me to know, and she could hear my voice. So I can see these two men on the side of the road asking for compassion and asking for sight. And the Scripture says he had compassion on them. Until you feel like you've almost lost your sight. A, a couple of months ago, many of you know I had implants put in. I know you can't see them. But H.D., when I hit a golf ball, I know how far it goes. I saw that guy out on the tee fixing to hit that golf ball, and the guy yelled, yelled at him, Sir, you're hitting from the women's tee. Now, again, in golf, you've got seniors, you've got women's, you've got athletes, and you've got juniors or whatever. Okay, you've got like four different places you can hit from. And he yelled at him, Sir, you're hitting from the women's tee. And he looked at the guy, and he got ready to hit, and then the guy yelled again, Sir, you're hitting from the women's tee. The guy looked at him again in, in exasperation, got ready to hit again, and the guy yelled at him, and he said, Whoa, don't yell at me again. This is my second shot. <laughs> I know you'd get that one. <laughs> Felt like me, but I, I can see. I can see. And I remember when they put the implants in, I couldn't even read the writing on a TV. I couldn't read the closed caption, couldn't read my Bible, couldn't read this one. And when they put them in on just one eye, I remember I was watching the TV, and all of a sudden I could see, and I started weeping. That's how I could see. And I got to remind myself how blessed I am that I can see. I can see. And then when they did the other eyes, like, oh, man, this is really, <sighs> what a blessing. You did it too, didn't you? You didn't do it because of me, huh? Was, it, was I your motivation? Just say yes. Who was? Who? Tony. Tony was. Were you were my motivation? Were you my motivation? Just say yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> Painful sympathy. I got to start closing. Jesus touched a leper. Would you call lepers half dead? Excommunicated? Removed away from family and friends? Having to yell unclean every time somebody got near them, it's a long closing. Mark 140 offers the most telling example of what compassion meant to our Lord Jesus. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, painful sympathy. You know, I, I got a Band-Aid on my, this morning my skin just broke loose and I had blood flowing. Why you wear black, Pastor? It covers blood easy. And uh, I had to put a Band-Aid on it. And I think about stuff like that that takes place. And you didn't ask for it. It just begins to happen. And I think about leprosy and how they lost their fingers and their nose and their ears and outer appendages. And, and Jesus, filled with compassion, reached out his hand, and he did something that was illegal. He's such an outlaw. Jesus was such an outlaw. He broke the religious laws over and over and over again. That's the theme of our carcel. That's why your T-shirts say the original outlaw, because he, he touched a leper. You don't touch a leper. If you do, you get leprosy. Don't touch a leper. Don't eat armadillos. You eat armadillos. I didn't know that you could get leprosy from eating armadillos. If I wish I'd have known that <laughs> before me and my brother-in-law in Utopia, Texas, shot one and tried it, it wasn't good. 
but we were hungry. <laughs> Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand, touched the man, I'm willing. He said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him, he was cured. It's the most shocking part is that, not that he was healed, we know that Jesus heals, but that he would touch him. He wasn't afraid to do and reach out and connect with somebody. Real compassion is more than a feeling. Real compassion moves from feeling to action. It's illustrated. This one sentence, Acts 10, 38, this one sentence summarizes the ministry of Jesus. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. He went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. That's what he was doing. Amen. So I'll go back to this. We need this new birth of compassion. Oh, yeah, we've been born again. We've been born again. But we need a new birth. Man, when we, it's not just for a car show coming up to reach people. It's throughout the rest of our lives. It's a mission moment. Amen. To reach people and connect folk. Was Jesus a do-gooder? You better believe it. He always was going around doing good. That's who he was. But he didn't mind breaking the law. If, I, if the law said I can't touch, I'm going to touch. Amen. I'm going to connect. So the question goes back to who is my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? It's the one who showed mercy. It's the one who showed mercy. Our neighbors are all around us. Amen. The simple answer, or, or so it would seem, but buried within it is a deep theological question. All the Jews knew that God commanded his people to love him with a whole heart. But Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18 added, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So in loving God, if loving God is hard, imagine how hard it is to love your neighbor. So first you've got to love God. Amen. And the fact to me that this, this spirit, this spirit, this robber spirit, I hate the spirit of a thief. I like to say I hate thieves, but I'm supposed to love everybody. But I'll shoot you and pray for you. In Jesus' name. Can I get an amen? I mean, I don't have to shoot high. But I shoot you and pray. I just, it's, thieves, the, the robber spirit always is what's yours is mine. In my lifetime, I cannot remember seeing so many thieves. Not, not just one, but in groups, smashing and grabbing, unwilling to work to provide. That's a spirit that's moved on our young people that told them they ain't got to work like the rest of us to get what we got. Amen. They can just go steal it. Amen. The insurance should take care of it. You walk in the wrong place, thief, and you're going to find yourself. You try to steal Billy's cows and find out. I'm serious. Did, did you, you just don't do it. You say, well, what, well that, you, don't, you can't shoot them for a diamond. Oh, it ain't about the diamond. It ain't about the cow. It ain't the fact that you just stole my four-wheeler last week and you come back to get the other one this week. It ain't about that. It's the fact you're a thief and you need to hit bottom. Amen. You need to figure. So here the robber beat him down. <sighs> that religious spirit was mine is mine. Amen. It's inside here. I don't have to deal with you. I ain't, I'm going to pass by on the other side. They had no interest in him. Amen. Listen, the opposite of love is not hate. It's apathy. It's, it's not caring. Just don't care. Don't care. Now, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say some things because i gotta, I got to close up here very quickly. But i got, I got to make this statement. Either the Samaritan got involved or the man died. Either the Samaritan got involved or the man died. Either Jesus got involved or they stayed blind. Either Jesus got involved or they weren't fed. Are you hearing me? Either the man got involved, the Samaritan. And, and in fact, it's a Samaritan tells me something. You know why he helped him? Because they've put me down my whole life. They've talked about me my whole life. They called me dog their whole life. They didn't love me their whole life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when I saw this Jewish man beat up by other Jewish people, I'm just guessing here in the story because the Bible separates him as a Samaritan in certain. And a Levite we know was a Jewish. Priest we know was Jewish. But this Samaritan thought, you know what? They passed me by, but I'm not going to pass you by. I'm going to have sympathy for you because there was sympathy for me. 
You can't rescue everybody. This is not a message telling you to rescue everybody. I'm going to go rescue it. No, no, no. You can't heal everybody. You can't rescue every baby. When I stood in the front of abortion clinics, I knew I could not save every baby. But I promise you, I got to raise three of them. You can't save them all. You can't rescue them all. You can't help every homeless person. And Crosby, you can't go down on 59, go crawl under uh, high, uh, Interstate 59 and say, okay, I, all you guys come. I want y'all to live here on my property. I got one acre. Uh, you're not going to do it. So listen to me. And this is probably the most important thing I'm going to say. If God puts someone in your path, not someone who jumped in your path, but truly in your path, that very well could be a divine appointment. As a pastor, Penny Brown, you understand this. There's a lot of people that try to jump in my path. I get messages every week. Can you help me with a hotel here? Can you help me with my gas here? Can you jump in in front here? Can you give me food here? And, and I don't even know you. What you've done is you've called church after church after church, and you're doing pretty good. And you say, jump in front of you here. But if God puts somebody in my path, and I know and I discern that was God that did that. I'm helping that person. I'll reach in my pocket. I'll go to my refrigerator. I'll put gas in there. I'll fix that vehicle because I've done it for 40 years. This is the most important thing right here because a lot of people want to jump in your path because they know you always help it. Beware of those. What you want. Because listen, Jesus, they tried to make Jesus in one, one place. They tried to make him stay in one town. Just stay here. There's a lot of sick people in this town. Just stay right here. He said, no, I got to go to the next town. In other words, there's people over there I got to connect with. Of course, there's a lot of folk in this town that need healing, but I got to go to the next town. I must go through Samaria. Amen. The moving on. So it's not a matter of busyness. Nor is it a matter of preparation. I suppose one could argue that his background as an outcast made him more likely to respond to that human need. But compassion has moved him to action. And at that particular moment, this particular Samaritan saw this particular man robbed, beaten, left half dead and said, you know what? I'm going to help him. Then Jesus said, which of the three? The robbers, the priest. Uh, who was that other guy? The Samaritan. Who is the neighbor? He said, the one who had mercy, the one who had pity, the one that had compassion. Church, I'm asking you, open up your heart. Begin to ask God, Lord, this week, this week, just give me one. Just give me, let me know for sure it's that one. Let me help that one that's half dead. Do you know what half dead looks like? Half alive. I got that as a revelation right there. Look for that when it's half dead. And I'm telling you, a lot of the folk that do reach toward, jump in my way, I do help. But I've got to discern it. I've got to discern it. I mean, I'll get a call. Look, if you don't help me today, I'm not going to make it, Patsy. And I, I've done this. And I don't even, I don't touch it. It's just on messenger. The next day I get a call. Hey, if, if you'll help me today, I think I can make it. Well, I thought if I didn't help you yesterday, you wasn't going to make it. Well, didn't you? You made it a whole day. So I didn't help him. Next day, I get a third message. I sure could use your help today. I bet you could. So you're, just, you're just fishing. You're just fishing for money. Amen. Work. Work. Amen. You see, in the story Jesus told, the real question is not who's my neighbor, but rather whose neighbor will I be to those I meet today? Whose neighbor will I be? The bonus is always on me, not on those in need. It's not about the man in need. It's about those who had a chance to help and didn't. The priest, the Levi, amen. Those that had a chance. And the one man who did what he could, even though he could have walked away. He could have said, I'm a Samaritan. I can't help you. But he picked him up. He poured it all in wine. That's a whole sermon there. The anointing. Joy. Poured it. Put him on his own donkey. He didn't say, walk behind me. I'll drag you. No, he put him on his own donkey, and he led him to an end. He didn't have to do that, and he gave him to a caretaker. Some people said it was the, that, that building was really the church. 
that we've been brought in and, and we're to be taken care of. Two, two, I'll give you two coins, two silver coins, or two, two, which represented two days, two days worth of, uh, of caring for this man. Amen. But I'm coming back through. And some have looked at that as 2,000 years because a, a day to the Lord is like 1,000 years. And 2,000 years I'm coming back again and we, his church. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not trying to make a theological supposition. I'm just telling you that this is a hospital. It's not a museum. This is a hospital. Amen. And uh, we're here to bless and help people in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm asking God to give you the eyes of a missionary that God will put people in your way. You're going to know it's divinely given this week. He's divinely going to put people in your path. Young people, it's going to be somebody that, that you can connect with. There's going to be a sympathy going to go. You know why I believe the Samaritan helped him? I believe he had been beaten up. I believe he had gone through life, stones thrown at him, people being mean toward him, and he came and picked him up. Heads bowed, eyes closed. He loved us. Oh, how he loves us. You take the blindness and you give us vision. You told us our feet that spread good news are beautiful. There's something about you, Jesus, that just, uh, I can't wrap, wrap my mind around you. You're amazing. I'm asking for compassion. On the cross, you forgave those who nailed you there. <laughs> you gave your mother, your disciples charge over your mama. He's such a wonderful Savior. Thank you for reminding us today. In Jesus' name, amen. You had communion. You had a chance to give your life to Jesus. If you didn't do it, Listen, are we without excuse? Are we without excuse? If you go to hell from Crosby, Texas, it's your fault. It ain't never going to be my fault. I told you over and over again. Amen. We love Jesus in this house. May God give us compassion for the lost. Amen. In order to do that, God's got to soften your heart. He got to soften your heart. He got to, you got to break up the ground inside of here in Jesus' name. Well, I got to get out of the way. Hallelujah. Give God praise in this house. Would you do that? Yeah. Our servant leaders would come up real quick. And uh, again, guys, if you need a, if you want a muscle car Sunday t-shirt, I, I know somebody said, it ain't got a car on it. I know. It's got who I think Jesus looks like when he's laughing. That's the one. That's the original outlaw right there. Amen. And in my heart, this is our car show. It's going to be different this year. And uh, we're praying for good weather for November the 12th. Plan B will be in the building. We'll have to. We'll pack inside that building. Amen. If it's cold that day, we'll just all pack in there. I'm just telling you, <laughs> I'm hoping we'll be outside. We got, we got chairs. We got all kind of things we're doing. We got the tractor drivers, amen, and uh, all the people that are involved in, in uh, uh, selling the T-shirts. And, and I've, given, I've given instructions to everybody. I'm giving you all time to write out your check. That's all I'm doing right now. Uh, but I've given everybody the, the, the pit crew the, the responsibility to go get their own crew this year. Go find everybody you need. I ain't waiting on you all to sign up in the back and not show up. Go find reliable men and women that will help you drive tractors and help people get on and off. And, 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 and Bob, be at the gate, you know, and, and greet people when they come in and wave at them. And, and go, go, go out to the car shows and, and encourage people to come in. Dennis, I've talked with Heath, and I'll get that number to you. Heath Moore is going to be over our speed ministry. and get, Give Dennis and Cheryl a break. Who's Heath Moore? If you've ever watched Texas Iron, he's the guy that does the upholstery. He's actually... What's that? Uh, yeah, Texas Metal. I, I saw him on there. I, I was watching it one day. I went, hey, that guy goes to our church. And that was weird, you know. And since now, we've become good friends. And if you've ever heard of SEMA, which is one of the largest or the finest car shows in the world, not just America, but the world, you know, he's, he's done stuff at SEMA. So he's going to be trying to help us uh, get, get some more hot rodders out. But that doesn't excuse us to do it. 
We've got to keep reaching. As we give today, we're believing God for? Gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom. Those who are going with us this week are going to leave Thursday morning, 9 o'clock, kickstands up, heading to Canton, Texas. Amen. We're going to meet other people there. Pray for our, our bikers. We've got a, quite a few scooters going. If you haven't signed up, still want to go, 9 o'clock, we're leaving the church out at, uh, in New Caney. Pray for us. I understand weather's going to be changing all day. Amen. Be in your dear stands in the morning. God bless you. Love you. Give Pastor David a hand as he comes.